Hi, this is Professor Stugard, and in this video we're going to discuss Bayes' Theorem. So, in this video we're going to hopefully understand the reasoning behind Bayes' Theorem uh, through an example, and then we're going to learn what the actual formula for Bayes' Theorem is and the notation and the definitions that we use when we talk about it. So let's jump in with our example. So, for this example, um, we're going to be talking about mono, so or mononucleosis, uh, which is a highly contagious disease that is common amongst teenagers and young adults, also called the kissing disease, um, and especially college students. So the following data has been collected by a university health center. They found that 0.5% uh, of students that come into the health center have been diagnosed with mono, so half of a percent of students have mono. 90% of those students that have mono do come in with a sore throat, however, and then overall, 30% of the students who visit the health center complain of a sore throat as one of their symptoms when they come in. So a doctor at the center wants to determine, well, what is the probability that if a student comes in with a sore throat, what is the probability that they have mono? All right, so first of all, let's take these percentages and convert them to proportions and probabilities and use our proper notation. So the first one, we have 0.5% of students were diagnosed with mono. So the probability that a student has mono is 0.005. Then we have 90% of the students with mono have sore throats. So now we're looking at two things. So we have a conditional probability. We know the student has a sore, uh, we know the student has mono and what's the probability they have a sore throat. So the way we write that is well, the probability that a student has a sore throat, given they have mono, is going to be 0.9. So again, it's our event, then that vertical line, and then, well, what is our given? What do we know already happened? How are we restricting our sample? Then the last part, 30% of all students that visit the health center complained of a sore throat. So the probability that a student has a sore throat is 0.3. And then of course, what we're looking for is a different conditional probability. We're looking for what is the probability the student has mono given they have a sore throat. So that's really the question that we're trying to answer at this time. Uh, and if you notice, that is actually kind of the reverse of one of the probabilities that we already know, right? We know that the probability that a student has a sore throat given they have mono is 90% of the 0.9. We wanna know what's the, the reverse of that. And that's where Bayes' theorem comes in. It relates those two probabilities together. So let's actually break this down and talk about this in terms of expected value, because it's much easier, I think, to understand and, and see what's going on if we have actual numbers here to look at. And it's gonna help us calculate our probability as well. So we wanna consider how many students we would expect to fall into each of these categories if let's say 2,000 total students visited the health center. And I just made up the number 2,000, um, but it'll work well for this example. So the way we calculate expected value is the number of trials or our sample size, which in this case is gonna be the 2,000 students, then times the probabilities that we, well, just mentioned a second ago. So if we're talking about how many students we would expect have mono, well, that's gonna be the 2,000 students times the 0 0.005 or 10. So we would expect that 10 out of those 2,000 students would have mono. Then what's the probability that a student has a sore throat given they have mono? Well, this is where we change our number or our sample size a little bit because I'm not looking at the whole 2,000 students anymore. I'm only looking at those 10 students that we already know have mono. So out of those 10 students, we know the probability is 90%. So nine out of 10 students are gonna have a sore throat when they have mono. Then our last one, how many people do we expect would come into the center with a sore throat? Now we're back to the 2000 students, um, right? There's no conditions to this probability. So out of those 2,000 students, if a sore throat occurs in 30% of those students, that's 600 total. So 600 out of the 2,000 are going to have a sore throat. Now, let's actually visualize this uh, as a grid. So 
Each one of those squares is actually one of the 2,000 students who have visited the center. So there's actually 2,000 squares there. Uh, go ahead and count. I'll wait. No, I'm not. Let's talk about the sore throats first. So the light blue squares are going to represent those 600 students that have sore throats. So I've colored 600 of those blue, or 30% of all the total squares. Then we talk about the mono. So again, mono is only 10 out of those 2,000. So I put that in red. That would be 10 out of the 2,000 students. Now we can actually take a look at solving this problem. So we are interested in what's the probability a student has mono given they have a sore throat. So we are already restricting ourselves to just the students that have sore throats. So we are restricting ourselves to that blue section. I don't care about the white section anymore. I only care about the, those uh, 600 students that have sore throats or the 30%. Now out of those 30%, I'm going to overlay the students with mono. Now there's only 10 of them, but remember nine of them are going to fall into the sore throat category and one of them is not. One of them is going to not have a sore throat. So the ones that I actually want I'm going to make purple here because they are blue because they have a sore throat and they're red because they have mono. That's the overlap that I am looking for. I am really concerned about those nine students. And so if I'm only concerned about having a sore throat, that's already my given. That's going to be nine out of the 600 students or 0.015 or well, one and a half percent. So the probability that a student has mono, given they have a sore throat, is only 1.5%. And again, compare that to the other conditional probability. We know that if a student has mono, the probability they have a sore throat is 90%. Almost every student with mono has a sore throat. But if you have a sore throat, the probability you have mono is only 1.5%, which is much, much smaller. So. Let's take a look at this, kind of put it together in terms of probabilities instead of expected values. But again, the really nice part is that probabilities and expected values actually kind of work the same way because we kind of cancel out that end. But anyway, so let's take a look here. So the probability that a student has mono given they have a sore throat and it's typically given as this conditional probability. We, our denominator is the probability they have a sore throat. Again, we're restricting our sample. We're restricting ourselves to just the students with sore throats. But then the numerator, the part on top, they have to have mono and they need to have a sore throat. Well, the probability that a student has mono and a sore throat, we're going to treat that as two separate probabilities. One, the probability that they have mono, and then the probability that they have a sore throat given that they have mono. And remember, that's that, where, that's that same idea where I looked at the overlap, right? There was 10 whole students with mono, but only 90% of those students had the sore throat. So it took my 10 and shrunk it down to 9. And so I'm going to replace the numerator there with that, uh, that equality. And so now, well, that's Bayes' theorem. We've actually done it. That's that's exactly what Bayes' theorem states. Now, to help us see this a little bit better, I'm going to first color code it. So we're really talking about two different events here, uh, having mono and having a sore throat. And we're really concerned about how those two things are related to each other. Right? We have these two separate events going on. How are they related? This formula relates them for us. The probability that you have mono, given you have a sore throat, is equal to the probability of mono times the probability you have a sore throat given you have mono, again, right, those things are related on the top there, divided by the probability you have that sore throat, our restricted sample um, that, that we have to kind of start with for this. Now, when we talk about Bayes' theorem, again, hopefully we're all with us to this point. Bayes' theorem, we're just going to generalize this idea because those two events, having mono and having a sore throat, are not necessarily, um, you know, critical for this formula. We could swap it out with any two events. So in Bayes' theorem, we typically call what we're looking for our belief. So the probability that someone has mono is our belief, and then the sore throat is our evidence, which again, hopefully makes a lot of sense in the context of this problem. We want to know, 
you know, what is the probability that student has mono? What is our belief that the student has mono? And our evidence is the sore throat. And so Bayes' theorem is actually just well, replacing those two things. So what's the probability of your belief given the evidence? And it turns out that that is equal to the probability of your belief times the probability of your evidence given that belief, all divided by the evidence. And we usually simplify it to B's and E's or A's and D's or H's and D's, it, you know, it, it all depends on where you're looking up Bayes' theorem. But I really like this form where is your belief and your evidence, right? How likely is your belief given the evidence equals the probability of your belief times the probability of the evidence given your belief divided by the probability of the evidence. Now, I also like to set up a contingency table whenever I do Bayes' theorem problems. It helps me organize my thoughts much better um, it's kind of like drawing the squares, except you don't need to draw a thousand squares every time. We just need two different events that can either be yes or no that are complements of each other. Um, and again, you come up with some random number for your total. So in this case, I'm going to say there's 2,000 people total, and I'm going to make myself a contingency table. Now, the first part is mono, right? I know that 10 people have mono, yes, uh, and that means that 1,990 do not have mono. And then I can fill in the sore throat as well, right? We knew that 600 people had a sore throat, which means that 1,400 must not, using right, our complements, right? Everything's got to add up to our total. And now I can still work backwards and fill in the rest of my table. Now, I already knew that when I looked at the 10 students with mono, nine of them did have a sore throat, one of them did not. And that's actually good enough to finish our problem now, but let's fill out the entire table first because I can also talk about the students that do not have mono. Those uh, 1,990 students, they get split up. Um, and again, everything has to add together in your contingency table so that out of those students, uh, 591 had a sore throat, but did not have mono, which means that 13,000, or no, sorry, 1,399 uh, did not have a sore throat and did not have mono out of the 2,000 that visited the center. And then we can simply just look at the column that we want for our conditional probability. We can limit ourselves now to, all right, we know they have a sore throat, so we're only looking at the sore throat column. And then, well, what's my probability? How many students have mono given that particular part of my contingency table? Oh, it's nine out of 600, and we get back to our same answer from before. All right, so Bayes' theorem, again, that probability of your belief given your evidence equals the probability of your belief times the probability of the evidence given the belief divided by the probability of your evidence. Um, like I said, sometimes you'll see it as they talk about the hypothesis in the data. And again, I really like that as well because what's the probability of your hypothesis given the data? And we know that that's gonna to have to be equal to the probability of your hypothesis times the probability of your data being true given your hypothesis all divided by the probability of your individual data. So we do have uh, specific terms that we refer to these probabilities and Bayes' theorems by. Uh, so the probability of our evidence, or I'm sorry, the probability of our belief, the probability of our belief is referred to as our prior probability. That means that it's our initial degree of belief or the likelihood of our belief being true. And that's before anything else happens. What is our probability that this is true um, you know, just off the bat. Then we have our posterior probability. This is what we were calculating with Bayes' theorem, is the posterior, or the one that comes after, because the posterior probability is the probability of our belief after we account for the evidence. And, and that's gonna be a big part of machine learning. That is actually how a lot of machine learning algorithms learn. They have a belief and they have to update their belief based upon their evidence. As they gather more and more data, they update their beliefs. And that is a really critical, important part to understand when you're talking about something like a you know, Bayes algorithm. How do we update our beliefs given the evidence that is provided? And um, you know, it turns out machines are probably better at that than humans. Um, and then we have our other two probabilities. So the probability of our event, that's also a prior probability, um, but it's simply referred to as our kind of our predictor prior, or again, the evidence prior, because it's the probability of our evidence 
you will see that when we do something like the naive base there and we actually kind of get rid of that we 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 stop looking at that because it's going to be the same for everything um and we'll talk about that in just a second um and then of course we have our probability of our evidence given our belief, and that's our likelihood. And again, that's the reverse of that posterior probability. So um, a lot of times when we use Bayes, it's for classification. So what is the probability that something uh, belongs in this class given the data? And so the probability that the uh, of the data given the class times the probability of the class divided by the probability of the data. Now, the, the issue is that, again, a lot of times when we do classifications, it's not necessarily just a binomial classification. A lot of times, um, well, we're, we're doing classifications, there might be multiple classifications, and then particularly, even more importantly, is that a lot of times when we're doing these predictions and we're trying to do these classifications, well, there's more than one variable. So the data is actually varied. So in this example, let's say we have, um, we're trying to classify something based on our data, but our data actually consists of three different variables. So let's say we have uh, variable one, two, and three, so D1, D2, and D3. So we wanna know what's the probability of the classification given variable one, two, and three? Well, the numerator then we have to figure out, well, what's the probability of the, of, data one, two, and three, of what's the probability of variable one, two, and three given that class times the probability of the class. And it turns out that that's really, really difficult. So what Naive Bayes does is we assume that, that that first conditional probability, well, they're all independent. The probability of variables one, two, and three, they're all independent. Now, is that true in real life? No, of course not. That That is never true. Um, it That would not make any sense, right? Almost all things are somehow related to each other. In fact, that's usually what we're trying to prove is that variables are related to each other. But the great part is, is that the naive Bayes theorem, which is called naive because it's assuming independence where it probably shouldn't be, but it works really, really well. Then the other part is that we can get rid of the probability of data one, two, and three. We can get rid of that denominator because every time we do our classification, it's gonna be the same. We're always, always gonna have that same denominator over and over again. So it turns out we can actually kind of ignore it and we might not get an exact probability, but we can get a proportional probability because they're all gonna have that same denominator. We ignore the denominator, make our lives a little bit easier. And when we combine all those ideas together um, and we assume all that independence, then we just have the probability of my, my point Right, my, my whatever I'm looking at, the probability of it being classified given data one, two, and three is now just the probability of variable one given that classification times the probability of variable two given that classification times the variable of probability, uh, given the probability of variable three given that classification times the probability of the classification. And that is a much simpler one to use. It's very naive, but it works incredibly well. Uh, particularly, when we assume uh, the independence, again, like I said, it's not the case, uh, we use it a lot of times in text analysis. So your spam filters, um, if we're trying to determine sentiment analysis, you know, is this passage happy, sad, you know, is this person in love, are they angry? We use Bayes theorem to help classify. Um, and again, that's using a lot of different text classification uh, problems that we look at. All right, so that wraps up what we talked about with Bayes' theorem. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with another problem, which I think is really kind of interesting. So there are 200 million daily Twitter users. How many of them are human? I don't know, right? But there's at least 200 million daily Twitter users. The total number of monthly Twitter, Twitter users is up in like the 300 millions, but we're gonna use 200 million for now. So the US government uh, uses a machine learning algorithm to determine if the tweet is dangerous or from a terrorist organization. And we're gonna say that that is 99.9% .9 effective. All right, so the first two parts are definitely true. The, there's 200 million daily Twitter users, that's true. The US government um, uses a machine learning algorithm to analyze every single tweet uh, that gets sent. That part is also true. 
I'm going to assume that they're good at their jobs. You can make other assumptions. Uh, but I'm going to assume that at least in this aspect that they are 99.9% .9 effective. So if we assume that there are 10,000 terrorists using Twitter to communicate, what is the probability that an account that belongs to a terrorist, I'm sorry, what is the probability an account belongs to a terrorist given that the algorithm flags it? All right, so I'm going to give you a few hints to help you set this one up. Number one, um, the probability that you get flagged given you are a terrorist, that is the 0.999. Right, this 99.9% .9 accurate. That means the probability you get flagged, given you are a terrorist, is 0.999. Right, that is the super effective part of the algorithm. Well, what is the probability that you're a terrorist? Well, that's going to be the 10,000 terrorists out of the 200 million daily users. So you're going to have to find that probability, and then. We're looking for what is the probability you are a terrorist given that you were flagged, right? That's the question that we want to ask. Now, my hint here is to make that contingency table. Draw out the contingency table first, see how that all works out, right? Use those numbers and see if that helps you find the answer to this Bayes theorem problem. All right, well, I hope this helped. I hope you learned something. And as always, take care of yourselves.